Howdy. Welcome, Howdy. Back. Welcome back, Dishon, uh, for anyone who's watching uh, over here. Um, I'm at the Yurok Nation in Northern California doing some work on Tribal Broadband Boot Camp. Uh, but I was just really thrilled that uh, Travis, Doug, and Kim were able to join us to talk a little bit about this, uh, the bead NOFO, uh, all the $42.5 billion. So we're doing an unscheduled event, and I'm in a slightly echoey uh, room where I have decent Wi-Fi because my hotel is on Frontier Service, and it is as good as advertised. <laughs> So hmm. <laughs> I'm here um, riding on the uh, the Yurok Telecom, the Tribal Nations Network that uh, uh, we're doing some trainings on to help them uh, expand it as well as others. So it's been a good time up here in Northern California working with local tribes. Um, but we got Doug Dawson, the, uh, the head of CCG. Welcome. Hey, I, I've always been meaning to say I am a sucker for elevator music and I love the intro music to this thing. So whoever <laughs> picked it out. So. It's. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm sure that Henry did it unassisted. He's terrific at. Uh, had terrific taste in those things. Um, we have. Uh, we have Kim McKinley joining. Uh, welcome, Kim. The uh, the head of the chief marketing officer for Utopia, as well as uh, I don't know, like a whole collection, it's more hats maybe than uh, than glasses at this point. Pro pro probably, and I agree with Doug. I like dance before we come on like stage every time to the music. So it's yeah. it's like a fun little thing. Is it going to be like a montage at some time that you're showing me dancing before we go on? To <laughs> I like it. And we also have Travis Carter, our longtime co-host. Welcome back, Travis. Oh, welcome, sir. I, I decided we will never do a breakfast bet. This is awfully early for all of us. So, <laughs> are you going to make it, Chris? Oh, I'm I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, this is our last day of boot camp, so it's the last day of major stress for me, and then I just get to go home and travel again on Sunday. So, um, uh, where I'll be seeing Kim. Um, uh, so I did. I should note while we're here that uh, this is the last uh, episode that uh, Henry will be producing for us, uh, likely. Uh, Henry is uh, moving on to uh, another um, opportunity. Um, he will hopefully still be doing some uh, contract work for us, but I don't think it will involve producing the show. So we wouldn't be here without Henry, and, uh, and I just want to thank Henry and uh, um, say that we're really going to miss him. We are. Oh, that's bad news. Thanks, bud. How are we yeah. going to do this without Henry? We're, you know, it'll probably suck. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we're going to talk about the NOFO. And we, um, we have a plan to start. We may have a guest join us in a little bit, uh, one of our previous guests, to uh, share some of, of uh, his thoughts on it. Uh, but we're going to start by running through some of the, the just like uh, the key dates and process. And then we're going to talk more about how uh, we think it uh, hits the mark, misses the mark, or um, I don't know if there's another option. So um, the most important thing is I think uh, the, the first date is going to sneak up on us really quick. Uh, July 18th is uh, when states have to uh, submit their letter of intent that they will participate in the program. So uh, that is on July 18th is when they can, uh, that's the deadline. And at that point, then they have the option of extending it, which means it will be extended <laughs> because I can't imagine an NTIA wants to um, have anyone, any state not, they want to bend over backwards so the states will be part of this. Um, but if states don't, question. Think, local coalitions could do it, but go ahead. Dean. How does like, why are we even like putting in a letter of intent to participate? I mean, I don't even understand well, that level. In, Texas and Florida both have governors <laughs> that are intent on on using any political moment to try to like raise their pure personal future. And they're talking about not participating. So NTIA wants to know, you know, what states are, are going to participate and which ones won't anticipate and some may not. There's a lot of press in Texas of not accepting the money. That's a political issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I think, you know, like, I think we can separate as we talk about this, a difference between like, um, a person who just wants to use this to benefit their future political career versus states that might decide not to participate because of the rules not working for them. So, um, oh, thank you. Curtis Dean says that, uh, more than half the states have already submitted their letters of intent. So, um, 
that's uh, an interesting data point. Uh, so as we go through this, um, we have the, the letter of intent, um, and then uh, states can put in a request for initial planning funds, uh, which would be $5 million that they would be able to use to help go through some of the next things we're gonna do. Um, at some point, the FCC and NTIA, um, I think maybe this year, and I say, I think some people are thinking likely in November, I think unlikely in November, um, FCC and NTIA will decide that the maps are no longer so bad that they can't use them and they will start to use them. And that will, they'll say, uh, they'll make a notice of available amounts where they'll use those maps to determine how much money each state gets. And each state a minimum of 100 million, but um, you know it's estimated that Texas might get two billion. Um, the money will be distributed based on some um, calculated formula of uh, of need. Um, when that notice of available amounts goes out, it triggers a clock, which is that states have 180 days before they start submitting extensions. A little bit of sarcasm from my point. Um, they have 180 days to develop and submit their initial proposal. Um, they have to design what their competitive process will be to distribute the grant. That's a word from Congress that states have to use a competitive process. And that initial plan, the initial um, uh, proposal, has to include local coordination. Um, it has to describe how they're going to do the competitive grants. And it must be made available for public comment, which I think is interesting. Um, and then I'll just, we're almost, we're, we're more than halfway through the description. <laughs> so after the after they submit that initial proposal, um, NTIA vets it. Um, there is, um, uh, NTIA will expeditiously, um, oh no, wait, okay, so after they, they said that, then um, there's a challenge process because at that point we have maps. And so local governments, ISPs and nonprofit organizations are all specifically listed as entities <coughs> that can challenge the validity of whether uh, addresses are correctly listed as unserved, underserved, or served. So that'll be, um, you know, I'm sure, a wonderful, very easy to navigate and totally clear process. Um, once the initial process that states put together is, is expeditiously reviewed, that's in the language that they use, um, at that point, states can get up to, or can get 20% or more of the total available grant funds that will be available to them. And this, at this point, we're well into 2023. There's no doubt about that. Um, and states can start their process to give out money once they start getting that money. They don't get all of it, but they get to start distributing money at that point. Um, and if they don't screw that up as they're going through it and NTIA is reviewing it, NTIA gives them the rest. Um, although they have to submit a final proposal, that has to go through another round of public comment. So and One clarification, Chris. Yes, please. That first round of money they get must go to unserved places. The right. state must have a plan to get all unserved places served before they can give money out to underserved places. So right, now what's interesting early, is that... Those early grants will go for the really rural stuff. So. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess that Doug has read this the most thoroughly. I think Travis and I are in the middle, and, and Kim has admitted that she's mostly relied on other people because uh, being on the road is difficult. <laughs> You're muted for silence, or at least I can't hear you right now. I made it to like page 10 or 11 where like all the bureaucracy <laughs> like got to me, but I yeah. read a lot of like. The real stuff starts of down at like page 30. You, you skip over that first, but that's timeline. Yeah. yeah, but I, I have not read the whole thing. I know Doug has. I read more than half of it, and I read it pretty closely. And one of the things I just wanted to note that I thought was interesting is that states have to have a plan to cover every unserved address, but they don't have to wait until the last unserved address has construction completed before they start spending money elsewhere. They just have to have the plan and be spending that money first, but they understand that it may take a while before that pipeline clears. So you don't have to wait for the pipeline to clear to go beyond that. So um, there's a, I think, you know, Doug had a really good post, highly recommend pots and pans by ccg.com uh, discussing this. Um, you know, I, Travis, you had a reaction that you felt like, and I've heard this from multiple people, but let's hear from you quick, that you looked at this and you were like, wow, not only is this, you know, mostly targeted at unserved where, where you know, it doesn't apply so much to, to the cities that you're, like, you're in in a more major metro, uh, but also that it looks horrifying. Um, so let's give you a shot to give your first reaction here. Oh, my, my reaction was if you're a small to medium sized operator, there's the, the hurdles that are laid out, at least what I've read, it's, it sounds like more of a funding to fund a plan 
than it is to fund to fund a, a project that actually hooks people up and does any good. I mean, I, I I'm looking at like I mean the list of just things I've picked out of here and I've probably listed is our climate resiliency plan. So okay. I do want to talk about that. So finish your list and yeah. we're going to come back yeah. to that first. Well, I mean, who's got that? I mean, we're out here. I don't, Kim, do you have one of the all this? Well, no, you don't need one, Travis. I think you misread that. And I think Doug might have, too. As I understand it, that's a requirement for the states. The states have to develop a climate resiliency plan. And that's, I think, largely so that, for instance, in California, you're not going to put a bunch of money into building above ground lines mm -hmm. where they're going to burn down quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not totally unreasonable, although I do think there's important questions about just um, bouncing priorities. Doug, when I talk, well, but the trouble is that's going to turn into grant requirements. The answer is every one of those ends up in the grant application process. You're right, but the, but the you know, like the biggie is the supply chain risk management plan. ISPs have to jump through a million hoops to prove when they're applying for the grant that they already have all of their materials lined up for the next four years. That's insane. But isn't this the problem that we're already seeing and it just came out is that the interpretation of what you're reading um, can be seen a thousand different ways. And I think that is part of the problems and how states really interpret it. I sure hope my, my whole point in life is it's, I hope states undo all the d damaging words in here. They have that power, I hope. <laughs> the yeah. people I've talked to, I think, are more from the states are, are a bit horrified um, at this. They feel like NTIA punted on the hard things. And, yes. um, and I've heard from others as well that this is, and I think we can talk a little bit more about this maybe, I think, especially once um, uh, we get our guest, if he's going to come on. This is like an area that I'm sure he'll want to cover. Um, but this is like a very political document. I think mm -hmm. this is um, this is about rallying a base for elections. It's about politics. It is not about rapidly connecting every um, unserved American or underserved American. Um, I think that's pretty clear from reading it. But I don't 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 you think this is really targeted at, at large incumbent ISPs? I mean, just not just, intentionally. Well, just, I mean, I don't. just the fact that they have disqualified unlicensed mm -hmm. uh, spectrum. I want to dig into that. Totally destroyed the vast majority of small operators that are out there. I I do not understand, and this is so. There's um there are technologies that are listed as being presumed good, basically that can be used, and technologies that are categorically unable to be considered. So there are technologies where if you have a service from an unlicensed wireless service that is 100 megabits up, 100 megabits down, is super reliable, it is still considered not served just right. because of the definitions. And um, on the other hand, DSL is presumed to be good, although it is more easily challengeable under the language. I don't know what the hell that means, but I, just, I don't get it. And then Doug- Well, I can, get, I can explain the DSL one. They had to have that in there so that they could, they could look at DSL places on the map and put them in the grant. No one expects DSL to win anything. So, because no, DSL will not meet the speed requirements ever. So, but, but it had to be there because it, it, it could count as underserved in a few examples in some places. And so that's why it's in there. It's, I that's, don't, true, that's the only reason it's there. So. I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, I don't, I don't get why they wouldn't just say DSL is considered, like is, at, at, is possibly unserved, but definitely underserved. Um, I mean, if they're gonna categorically wipe out unlicensed wireless, how do they not categorically wipe out DSL? I think Doug froze. He's not just thinking that hard. That hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like, do you think they, they did the wireless and satellite provision because of RDOF? It was a direct, like, kind of pushback to RDOF of, like, all of the wireless providers winning on that, on that grant or that no, that's money. that's true. I think that I think you're right, Kim, and I and I, I would separate those. Like I feel like, and I'm curious if you would too. I mean, you compete against some of these, but mm -hmm. like um, uh, the um, wireless, I think is, is separate from satellite, and we shouldn't say them yeah. in the same breath. Um, and I'm sure that Doug's going to come back. He was noting that he was having a few. It, it, it's interesting timing here. Reliable service definition, right? Mm -hmm. what, what? Who's Doug on? Because he's charter in a major market. Charter spectrum mm -hmm. in a major market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, disqualified for this grant. <laughs> oh, well, I do have a question because when they say underserved, it's 100 over 20, right? So what if you're getting one gig over 10? Is that underserved? Can you challenge that? I mean, I think that is a loophole that is really beneficial to some of these major markets um, to get some money. I mean, I don't know if it'll be used, but I think it is a loophole. 
I think it could be, but I think almost everyone that has cable gigabit is advertising more than 20 um, megabits up. And it's, it's um, not just what you're getting, it's what the plan is advertising, I believe. I thought you could challenge, the states could challenge it by showing proof that in those areas that they're not getting the, the 20 up, even though it's advertised. Isn't right, but you have, to, you have to subscribe to it and then show that you're not getting it, mm -hmm. um, which is where I think a, a challenge may be. Um, so yeah, Curtis Dean, um, thank you for, for writing, um, for noting this. So, I mean, I just, I, I, I don't understand how licensed fixed wireless is considered reliable um, and unlicensed is not. I, um, you know, I mean, Travis, um, in your experience, when you look at this, do you think that there is like a reason to have such a um, ultimate determination merely on the basis of whether a, a wireless link is, is licensed or not? No, I mean, I, I guess the, you know, the five gigahertz spectrum, I do agree is, you know, very saturated and in a lot of areas, but there are many, many, many high quality WISPs out there that are doing very good work in the frequency. And as we've alluded to, as the six gigahertz spectrum opens up, there's going to be more capacity there for these people to keep doing. So the question ultimately for me was, if there's a, you know, a four plus Google star wisp operating in what is considered an uns unserved area, would we overbuild it? And my, my, my answer is no, because most of the end consumers don't care how it's being delivered. They just want it to work. And well, I hope that I hope that what would happen is that Wisp would be eligible and would overbuild their own territory. I think a Wisp that does not go after this money in areas mm -hmm. that they're already well established is foolish because they should be the most competitive. Have you seen the requirements to get this money? I've never met a single Wisp that could do all of this government homework and fill out all these pieces of. They'd spend most of their money just applying for the grant. I think this is. I mean. Well, let's ask the, Doug yeah. has the most experience with this. And Doug, I'm curious. I mean, is this a case of NTIA telling the Rural Utility Service, hold my beer and here's more paperwork? My theory is they are so they got a lot of blame in 2009 for building middle mile to nowhere. Remember that? I do. And, I remember warning them about what happened. And they're so and some of those routes really did that. They also had some routes that were awesome. And so, you know, that's why northern Minnesota even has broadband because of that grant. And and but I think they're so fearful of giving out a bad grant that they're that they are being ultra conservative and making sure that nobody who doesn't qualify doesn't get a grant. And I think that every single person at NTIA on each of these topics got their own little piece put in. So now there's 30 new requirements we've never seen before. It is an absolute nightmare of a grant. It makes it makes it makes reconnect look easy. It's going to be unbelievable. So. My understanding of reconnect is that it's not only hard in the install in the um, application phase, but that it is very hard on an ongoing basis. Is that your sense here? Is that it will mm -hmm. also be difficult? This also has a ton of reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. The reporting requirements in here are gruesome. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be reporting by location, all sorts of details. Like, are you kidding me? Like this what? There's a whole page of reporting requirements, speeds and time, and also by location. It's it's just you know it, so there's a whole there's more reporting requirements than I've ever seen. That's more requirements than in, in our U.S. No, isn't um, I mean arguably isn't that what we're kind of wanting? I mean, like a lot of we, us are asking about speed tests and making. Well, we sure want accountability, can... but but to the point where you can't. It's Travis's point, but you can't make you can't afford to do this. I, my back of the envelope math says. The extra requirements in here are going to add ten percent to the cost of the grant. Ten percent. I've heard that, that, that's I've heard what I, that, I, it could be. That could be way too low. I call, I call Chris up. I'm like, you know, your dream of low cost internet. It just keeps eroding away. This just added five dollars mm -hmm. per month per subscriber. Right. Just, I mean, look at the financing issue. There's yeah. two different layers of irrevocable edits of credit. For that means you have on be to apply for the grant. Let's say you have a forty million dollar grant, ten percent matching ten. 25% matching $10 million. You have to go to the bank and get a $10 million line of credit. They consider that to be a loan. So you start paying two to three to 4% interest on that loan. If the grant takes a year to be awarded, you've just spent two to $400,000 out of your own pocket just to apply for the grant. Once you get the grant, you have to replace that with an, an immediate line of credit for the full matching again. And, and that completely wipes out the advantage of bank financing because the advantage of bank financing, as Travis knows, is it's a line of credit. You only start paying interest on the day each month when you take the money out. This makes you start paying interest on day one that your your grants awarded. That alone is going to add a that is, for a ten million dollar grant. That's going to add a million dollars of cost. 
And if you're a private That's company, crazy. Chris Dean, our current comment champion, is mm -hmm. uh, reminds us that um, you know if you're a private company or if you're a nonprofit company with a subsidiary a partnership, in many cases, you're paying a significant tax on that 75% mm -hmm. grant that you're yes. matching. So that's yeah. still See, the left. big guys, the big companies have no problem with those layers of credits because what they'll do is they'll they'll do what Elon Musk just did. They'll put their stock on hold to the bank and they'll get the instant letter credit. It doesn't cost them a penny. Everyone else is going to have to actually get a bank loan. This, if, I mean, ask Travis. This would cost you. A, this would cost you a million dollars. There is zero chance I would apply for this grant. No, in its, current state. It's, it's it's insane. And well, and, and the thing is, I'm thinking of all these wisps again, and I'll be the I'll be the, the champion, mm -hmm. the small guy. I I could probably think of three wisps that I know of that could even get a ten million dollar line of credit, a letter of credit at the bank. I you know, most, 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 of the, most of the little independent telephone companies can't get yeah. that. Here's a chicken and egg issue here. They because a letter of credit's based on your current books. And so you go yeah. to your current books and they go, Your books aren't good enough. You go, but I'm getting a $30 million grant. And they go, Well, you would qualify then, but until you get that, I can't give you the letter of credit. Mm -hmm. It's a chicken and egg thing. This is how I know Doug loves this NOFO. Like, I mean, Doug well, is I all in. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to say a couple things. First of all, thank you, Curtis, for actually watching us at uh 1022 yes, um, Eastern Standard <laughs> Standard oh, Time. He's on, he's on Central Time. Oh, he's on Central Time, yeah. so nine. But um, another question is, is how many employees do most WISP have? Like the average WISP, how many employees many. work there? Yeah, exactly. So how are you going to like like go through the loopholes? At Team Utopia, we have 100 um, in-house employees, and this would still be tough for us to navigate. So if you have five, how are they going to navigate this? Right. So I, I think it's, I agree with you. It's bureaucracy on top of bureaucracy, but I am not as negative on it as our friend Doug is either. Well, I'm hoping the states get their act together and undo some of the nonsense, but I, they're going to have well, a big fight. With, they're going to have a big fight with NTIA to do that. Well, just some, you know, some of the other requirements. One of the requirements that isn't, I think, is absolutely out of this world crazy, is you have to lock down your supply chain for the life of the grant up front. Yeah. Well, AT and T can do that. They already have those arrangements in place. No, no little company is going to get a con contractor to say, yeah, I'll guarantee you I will build for you three years from now. On top of that, that contractor has to guarantee that he's going to have a, 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 a system to train new employees during the price of that. There, he has to guarantee three or four things. He, and he's just going to go, I don't want to work on these grants. I'll go elsewhere. I don't think the little guys are going to find contractors. So this grant actually passes from the ISPs and puts requirements on contractors too. And they're going to go, I don't want this crap. They're going to walk away from little companies. They'll go, I'll build an, I'll build an ARPA grant for you, but I'm not building one of those damn B grants for you. Mm -hmm. You know, contractors, they don't do nonsense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to, I want to talk about some specific things. One is uh, what's good. Um, I think finger on the scale for fiber is what we were all mm -hmm. looking for. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Challenge process is awesome. Mm -hmm. So the FCC challenge process for the directly with the FCC is horrible. This one here, you just have to convince the states that the maps are wrong. So I think this is a great challenge process. And so I'm going to well, spend a lot of time. Like, I'm going to spend a lot of time reviewed. telling. Yes, but 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 the states are the one who gets to review and not the FCC. But I thought I thought NTA has to sign off on it too. Am I wrong? I thought that's what I saw. Mm -hmm. Only if there's a controversy, but you know, this, I think the states can take a pretty aggressive position on that. Okay. I think this is a fairly friendly. I don't think anyone's ever going to get through the FCC direct challenges because you have to put in alternate maps to the housing detail. No, no government has that detail. Here, you just have to convince them the speeds are wrong. I think. So but 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 I have a question, Doug. What like when are we going to get those FCC maps that we have to challenge? Well, the fact that you start what you do is you spend the rest of this year gathering all your speed tests, and when it comes out, you just look at your local community and see. So, I don't think they're going to. I think the first set of maps are going to be absolutely dreadful. Mm -hmm. They are yeah, so I mean, complicated. Not, they are horribly complicated. FCC is not anticipating releasing them until November, is the most recent that I've seen. Well, and if they release that first batch, they're going to. It's going to be just full of crap. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it doesn't fix the number one problem, which was ISPs can still put in any speed mm -hmm. they want. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the number one problem with today's maps, and that's still there. Okay, so we like the challenge process. We, we like do. the finger on the scale we for fiber. Like the challenge I process. like the public engagement, the public mm -hmm. comment. I like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it specifically also requires engagement with tribes, which I think mm -hmm. is important because a lot of people don't appreciate how 
constrained and difficult the relationship is between states and tribes. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, tribes shouldn't even have to deal with states given that they are sovereign entities that are supposed to have a head of state relationship with the United States government is my understanding of it. Um, but um, at, this, at least states are not able to ignore them um, in this process, I believe. Right. Now there's some stuff in here that sounds good that you think about it. Like if nobody applies for a really rural area, states are required to reach out to find somebody. But now we're back to Travis's. Who the hell are they going to talk? If they didn't apply the first time, because the kind of folks who fill in those little things are little guys, and they're going to go, no way am I going to touch that little pocket of people for this nonsense. <laughs> so, but states are required to do that, which I think is great. Uh, and in states like West Virginia and all, there's going to be a half of the state will be in those pockets. So I think that's wonderful. Well, one of the things that, again, I'm afraid that, Doug, you might be the only one that really understands how this works. I've seen some concern about areas that are deemed to be excessively costly. At that mm -hmm. point, that's bad too. Each stake is to determine what that means. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, again, the original promise of the congressional bill was this is going to solve the problem in the most remote places. That language is directly in the congressional law. This one says, well, if it costs too much, you can do something different. It's like, no, the money should go there first. Let's solve those. And if there's any money left over, then we'll look at the underserved places. Let's solve all those expensive pockets. So I don't, they're actually giving an out to not serve those places. They're going, that's where they're going to say, oh, they can have, they can have wireless. That's fine. Except they might be in a place in Appalachia where wireless doesn't work. But, but you know, so, so yeah. I mean, I have a client who's on an island who just freaked out completely over that because they're like, uh oh, we're never going to get any money. <laughs> Yeah, I think I know who you're talking about, and I've, I was uh -huh. seeing him in person, and um, yeah. yeah, they're uh, um, they've been screwed a few different ways. I think they actually were in an area where they literally were found to be not as eligible because they had like their speed tests were like it wasn't it like ten point five by like one point one. Oh yeah, sorry, like, oh, you have ten one. Right. Oh yeah. Anyway, anyway, the the problem is every little thing in here. My biggest issue is it doesn't meet the promise of the congressional language. I thought the congressional bill was very good language. I actually thought it was really decent. And, and in almost every case, they've interpreted it in the most conservative way. I, Why I do you think that is? That. Why do we think that is? Well, it's either it's either Chris's politics, which, or or it's the uh, they're being conservative, don't want to make mistakes. I don't know which of the two. I I'm going to find out. I know. I know people there. I'll find out eventually, but I probably oh, won't you, be able to say, I will probably won't be able to say. <laughs> you, you know everybody, Doug. You're the most popular yeah. person in broadband. But I think it's they're just really like maybe I'm too optimistic on this. I think they're just really trying to be conservative because they don't want so. to be the, my, the yeah. yeah the clusters of what some of the other right. grant programs have been. Like, and they yeah. But go but ahead, like, Chris. Let's, let's be clear. Like they're being they're making some decisions in some places, but like in other places, it, you know. Um, it seems to me like they're just ignoring the law. Um, I mean, they, their reading of that, uh, the law says that states um, have to allow cities to apply. And so NTIA's reaction is to say, well, states cannot categorically prohibit them from applying, but if they design a mechanism that just doesn't actually give them any money because they're they're right. secretly, you know, prevented, then, you know, well, what are we, what are we going to do about it? And they get, they, exactly. They gave them an out on that. They gave them an out to not give any money to cities. And the, and yeah. the congressional law absolutely said cities are in. So every case, they, they did these little weird things. I mean, I feel for NTIA because Congress did not give them the explicit ability to preempt the rules. But I yeah. feel like, you know, what Nancy Werner from the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors has discussed is correct, which is states have to, you know, um, have to uh, make find ways that cities can participate or they have to turn down the money or like there's some sort of penalty or something like like that's that's what Congress said. And then I feel like NTIA in some ways they're like, oh, we have to follow exactly what Congress said. And in other cases, they're like, well, that's inconvenient. So let's not do that. Especially well, if, if, they, if, if they were to follow what Congress said, this would be an awesome no <laughs> Well, I think because half of NTIA has been there for like two months. So, I mean, let's be honest, they've hired half of their staff now. And I have a second point is that we should never do an early morning one of these ever again. We're clearly not as funny as we usually are. We are we're not actually funny at all. And, and, that's, and, it's Travis, and it's Travis's fault. Usually. Oh, I'm sorry. To make, sorry, guys. I'm trying to do my bit here, but... Uh, <laughs> 
I've I've tried to make two or three jokes. I'm 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 giving it a, <laughs> a try. I, I well, just yeah. I, feel, I feel naked if I'm not hiding behind my powerful microphone. You all know how bad my voice is now. Well, we, you know, we did. I can't believe that we've gone this far and not commented on your hair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just I'll sit up more, and then you can just comment on my. It's awesome. All, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, there's a thing called a rush, Chris. There's a thing called a rush. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I, I, so I, Doug, Chris, Kim, who actually is going to apply for these grants? Any sense? Well, because, well it will be, what banks are going to underwrite this stuff? So let's be clear: like different states will have different rules. So like it will like an entity that could apply in one state may not be able to apply in a different state, depending on how this the states. Well, implement. if the states are not able, for example, to get out of the letters of credit, then no, that's then the little guys are can't, aren't going to apply. Th those are that those are a killer. Most little ISPs can't get those. They're not available to them. And I know because in North Carolina, great grants have that requirement and all the little ISPs had to walk away. They can't get them. It's exactly the same requirement. I mean, it sounds like they copied the language. And so and, and you know, this has been something that's been brought up by, you know, WISPA by others for years. That this this language, I mean, this goes back to the FCC has this requirement often, you know, some of the states do. This is not a surprise that that is that requirement is is um, is there. This is I mean, this is one of those things that pisses me off as a policy person because this is a bureaucratic cover your ass thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because like there you're in a position and this happens a lot in the small business administration in which your job is literally to fund business models that are on the edge right the market will fund solid business proposals in most cases if we have a working market if we do not that's why we have a small business administration that's why we have broadband grant grants these involve higher risk that the private sector does not want to fund on its own and then the, and then the bureaucrats because they don't want to have to answer to elected officials that are going to rant and make them the enemy and demagogue them they put in all these requirements to try and make sure none of the loans go bad well guess what if you're going to invest in the hardest to reach areas the highest cost areas you have to take some risks and some of those risks are going to go bad and we just need some freaking adults in the room that are willing to stand up. And I say that both among elected officials and among the bureaucrats that are making the rules. And, well, they will, and that's yeah. back to what Kim and I both were, we both yeah. said it's a risk issue. That's what I believe mm -hmm. is wrong with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I my opinion has always been get the fiber built. I don't care if the ISP fails. The fiber is still there. Somebody else will pick it up. So let's get the, so, you know, that it doesn't bother me if an ISP fails. I mean, it, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but it will happen. Uh, Kim, you were going to say something too. Yeah. Well, I was going to, first of all, they won't let us in the room if they need adults in the room. But second of all, are you going to see more consortium of like communities coming together to try to build their own ISP to combat some of these rules and go after the money? I think that's an interesting point that I hadn't even thought of until like we we're just talking today is that could be a loophole that some of these areas could get into if they don't have any uh, restrictions on muni broadband. Well, they haven't said yet how they're going to make communities do the letter of credits, but that's almost impossible to do one of those with, with grant finding. So that's going to be a huge problem. Grants don't exist to the day that an investor buys it. So you can't, you can't get a letter of credit for it ahead of time. No bank in the world would give you one because banks, sometimes the bonds don't sell. So, so you can't do a letter yeah. of, of credit that is contingent on an event. Is that right? Not on, not on an event that, that has, mm. has no guarantee of happening, correct? That's impossible to do one of those. I mean, we should just introduce banks. To and, and, and the NTI and the NTI says in here, we don't have a solution yet for cities. And they punted on it. So yeah. Now I want to I want to talk more about the supply chain because one of the things that I'm hearing is a lot of frustration about both labor and uh, supply chain. Uh, we have the Buy American provisions. There was a, a, a belief that. Um, uh, we would see, uh, well, first of all, as we, we go back, uh, originally it was, I think NTIA basically said, we're not going to do waivers, you know, for hardly anything. We're going to really stick to the Buy American. And then they started to soften it, I think, when they heard more from everyone. And they, um, uh, now it sounds like these rules are back to some very difficult supply chain management, not just that you have to do it many years into the future, but that you have to um, buy a lot of things that are going to be made in the U.S. One of the people that I've spoken to that builds networks in rural areas has said, 
They believe this will drive the costs up well beyond the 10% that Doug had suggested uh, because vendors themselves are going to have to be quoting prices on materials before they, that vendor knows if they can get mm -hmm. a waiver for the Buy American. So there's a law, there's a law in Congress that's actually passed. It passed the House and then it, the Senate did a different version of it. It's been passed back to the House. And, and it's, it's the bill that's, it's a little piece of the Build Back America plan that's intended to promote factories coming back to the US. It adds a ton more strength to the Buy America and makes it clear that there's no waivers. So the, that's gonna override this law because that, that law very clearly says Buy American period. And, that, and that's going to, so it's going to be signed any day now. It's so it's, once it comes back through that recycle and it's, and it's part of that, let's build factories. I, and I love the idea of bringing factories back to the US, but that's going to kill this particular set of projects, you know, because of timing, those things take six, eight years, right? So. Kim, I wasn't sure if you were going to jump in there. Oh, no, I wasn't trying to jump in. I'm at my dad's house and somebody was like waving at me through the door. So I had to tell my dad to go answer the door. So one of the things that we're um, relating to the Buy American, I feel like um, uh, a criticism that I've heard about this uh, was that this is a very uh, political document that, and I, and I think we can agree that like there's multiple goals. And one of the goals is that when we spend money, we should be um, supporting American industry and that sort of a thing. But that's intention with the other goal of as rapidly as possible, making sure that everyone in the United States of America has good broadband service. And to me, it looks like NTIA wants to believe that they can do everything all at once and they don't have to make any trade-offs. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. Um, you can't you can't get low cost broadband. You can't get broadband to everywhere. You can't have supplies built in America and, and have all of these things and happen at once. You have to, you have to make compromises. And I think that's where this document fails because it's, it's really trying to cover all the bases without giving, giving, giving anything. And, uh, and I think, yeah. Oh, they invented ahead. something new, a middle-class rate plan. <laughs> yeah, like there's already a low-cost rate plan. The middle class is everybody else. So that <laughs> means everybody gets low rates. You can't make the project work. Is that, is that one of the things that you reacted to as well, Travis? What's your middle-class plan? You, you know, I, I just, I, I find this comical and I linked that little thing. I always talk about that little section from Back to School, the movie, where Rodney Dangerfield goes, oh, no, that isn't the way it worked. Here's how you do it. You order from 17 different vendors uh, and whoever ships is who you pay. And you hope to God that, that one of the 17 will come through. Oh, and then, by the way, you buy 10 acres of rural land and you, you start piling up product for your 2024 build as whenever you can get your hand on wherever it comes from is where it comes from. So I don't know where in what world, you know, basically I think this document was written by a bunch of people that have never actually built a network right. before. That I I mean, it's gotta be, I mean, it's, this stuff is so ludicrous that I, I honestly don't, and I go back to my other questions, who's going to apply for this thing. I, there's nobody I know that would, are, are yeah. you going to risk your entire future on all these rules who would do that and that's that's i want to i want to i want to stick on that for a second because i think it's an important note because the people who worked on this they um have a number of goals in mind and many of them are goals that we all share and mm -hmm. and i and i think it is true that many of them have not worked in building a network um in part because everyone who's ever worked as building a network is probably building a network right now with all the money that's available um but the, um, the, the, the thing that I hear, I've heard it just occasionally from some of my public interest folks. And I, it's not as, I think maybe people in industry might think it's more common. But there is a sense among some folks, uh, and, and I mean, it's, more, it's in the morning. I'm going to try not to be too salty. I'm, I'm often saltier in the morning. Um, but there's like a sense of, well, you know, if, if the companies, if Travis can't follow these rules, then F him. You know, like we don't need him. We'll have someone else do it. 
and 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 I think that's sort of the, the sense. And I don't think a lot yeah, of except the only the only other person is charter. So is that right. That's it. That's a, it's an important point. And I think that like yeah. people don't appreciate that Travis has a working business model, right? Mm -hmm. Like Alan Davidson, like from from the the broad, broadband um, open broadband, like all of the people that we have on our shows, like. They have working business models. They don't need this money, but they are trying to figure out how to serve people. And like, these are the people we want to make it work for. Uh, and so, you know, like, you know, Travis is not going to be like threatened by this. It's just that we're missing opportunities to have the kind of people we want to build networks, build them because we've included too many onerous rules. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Yeah, no, I was going to say, it's like for Team Utopia, do we go after $1 million for these unserved homes and jump through, you know, years of paperwork? Or do we just go build out city after city after city and continually um, build your network out? And it's because you're not going to waste your time or people who have any any like weight are not going to waste their time of like dealing with a million dollar grant when they can do $75 million worth of projects in that same time. Uh, frame it's just not going to happen right and, um, and you mentioned alan and alan these rules are similar to north carolina grant rules and he can't get grants in north carolina very similar rules to this so it does keep out those isps so right we have empirical evidence of it <laughs> yes. yes yeah but hold on there, there is something good here that's going to happen about what what do we think eight ten years from now doug there's going to be a whole bunch of dead fiber around the country we can pick up for ten cents on the dollar. That's a, I don't. Like, I don't know if there will. Well, that, that, that happens. If that happens. You and I are going to go into business doing that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to be a I'm, fiber scrapper. I'm holding out for five cents on the dollar, though. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I do have a question to Chris. Let's let's hear Chris's point. You've said that in the past that like thirty to forty percent of this money will be used for good. Do you still believe that with the no foes out? I've heard dispiriting things from folks that are building low cost networks. And, and a part of that is also the labor um, requirements, which I, I still don't really fully understand. Um, and I, I know I had said that I, I had hoped that we would have 30 to 40% that was well spent. And if we did have 30 to 40% that was well spent, it will have been worth the other money because we will get such benefits out of that. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's going to take longer to spend this money. I, I think we may well see that states are, are really struggling to find people that want to do this because I think we're all expecting, right? Like if you can imagine a picture of like charter or, or Comcast service territory, they're going to go like a mile or two out, right? They're going to just expand a little bit, but they're not going to be going into these rural areas where states may have no one applying and they're, they're not, not going to be. Yeah, they're not going to go to the states where they don't have service today. No. Right. So. Yeah. So like who's going to build West Virginia with this money is what I'm, what I'm curious. Sudden about. link. Sudden link is coming Frontier. back. Let's hope not. Frontier's <laughs> going to ask for it all. They will. Yeah. No. I mean, that's it. so. Yeah. Frontier with a new management, like they're going to have the size they can they can comply with this stuff. Um, and then everyone's going to be wondering how we got to this place. Well, except um, that they will fail out on the high cost issue because <laughs> it's the cost. That's a high cost place to build. Sure. Now, the state of West Virginia has no choice but to say. We like high costs, so that that's they probably won't have any problem with that. There, so. Let's talk about the labor issue though more specifically, mm -hmm. because well, well, every I project like over five million has to pay Davis Bacon wages. You know, Davis Bacon is this is again one of my policy rants. It's one of those ideas that I 100% I support, and it's mm -hmm. been implemented in a truly um, ineffective way, right. uh, in a harmful way. Um, the idea of Davis Bacon is that um, if you get federal money, you have to pay prevailing wage. And the challenge is how one measures prevailing wage because different companies have different job classifications and things like that. And so the government is supposed to do surveys of different things. But what we saw in previous grant cycles from the federal government is that you're in rural Wisconsin and you have to pay um, the, the urban construction rates, even though okay. you, what you're doing is fundamentally different work for workers of a different class, simply because the federal government has not bothered to implement it in a way that actually makes sense. And so then you get to a situation where I feel like people are like, oh, well, so what? So they're outside plant people get to make extra money on this one job. Well, that doesn't work well when you have a workforce. Like, like these people over here are getting this, all this extra money for doing the same job that these other people are doing. And it's just, it's really bad. And, and I just, I'm so frustrated. Like I have a lot of good ideas and some of them I don't try to implement because there's no good way to implement them. And I wish other people would learn from this. No, and, and that's another big, that's another one that adds a ton of money to these things. The thing is, 
the construction companies who work in rural America believe they pay prevailing wage. They've, they've had workers on staff for the last 30 years and people are very happily employed. Isn't that a living wage? That's what I was thinking. They're just, they're just not downtown Milwaukee wages, but they're living wages when you live in rural Wisconsin. Right, because often, because the, uh, so I, I don't fully understand this again. And I, and I mean, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, come off being anti-union because no, I, I'm I, actually I, extremely pro-union. Grew up in a union household, I, but this, you know, the way they're applying, it's wrong, right? Right, and that's the issue <clears throat> is that you have people who, as you said, Travis, or as you said, Doug, and as I've seen, as I've gotten to know people who work outside plant, um, you know, there's certainly places where people are mistreated by subcontractors, absolutely, and and this is not an effective way to resolve that problem. But like a lot of times, people are paid by the splice or by the foot or by the something, and um, and okay, that now, goes, now we're going to get our first laugh here because you know who mistreats the subcontractors. Verizon. <laughs> they pinch them down to the point where they barely make any money. <clears throat> and they do it in cities. Well, my favorite is they don't pay for what, 90 or 120 <laughs> years, and then they then they debate mm -hmm. what you but did. They also, don't, they also don't pay them. They make them agree for three or four years ahead oh, of yeah. time on the rates. And with this inflation now, they, they literally can't make a living at those rates. But that's yeah. where I feel like the NTIA approach to that in the, in the Biden administration more largely, I think this is, this is where I say it's more political. And, and again, like, I mean, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to get people in trouble by attributing claims that, that they've told me. Um, but like, uh, there, you know, I'd also don't want people to think that I'm just making all this, I'm, that I'm just coming up with all this myself. This is an amalgamation of other folks, which is basically what I do in life is <laughs> to go to <through> the <laughs> and repackage them. <laughs> but, um, but they, um, this is an effort in which, like, I feel like the Biden administration is taking a middle road that sucks, right? They're not actually going to result in better working conditions and higher pay for people. It's just going to add a bunch of extra paperwork that's going to drive up the cost of projects. That money's mostly not going to go to the workers and it's not going to be effective at accomplishing either the goal of connecting everyone or, you know, improving uh, the, the workforce in a way that uh, results in more money going in the workers' pockets. We'll create, a lot more, we'll create a lot more jobs. There it will. Jobs. People have, jobs. No, no, actually people doing construction and then the people who stay behind and maintain these networks. There'll be a lot of new technician jobs. Right, but you could do that just by putting money into construction. This not by okay. having all these extra data taking requirements. I agree. I agree. I feel like this is not like the usual dynamic we have today. Chris is like the one who's criticizing the federal government programs, and this never happens. He's the positive one on this. You know, you know, <laughs> ever, ever, ever since he got this new hair, I don't know who he is anymore. <laughs> the federal government's never made mistakes before, so I don't have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, what is the, ultimately, what is the objective of this grant? We is thought it, it was to get broadband everywhere that needs it. Isn't isn't that the litmus of success here? I mean, I it, if you, how many how many trillions no, of taxpayer dollars is this? Is Forty five billion. Forty five billion dollars. That's a that's to connect fewer than ten million. Money. Money. And how many how many additional high speed Americans do they want? that money to, to, to put on online or have on the order of fewer than 10 million, I'd say 10 million. So I don't understand if, if, if Kim were to come to mm -hmm. the, the government and go, all right, give us $10 million and we will guarantee you that we will hook up whatever, you know, a yeah. uh, hundred thousand people. Isn't that what we're trying to do here? Or Well, let me, let me contrast. Cause that's a perfect question. There are state grant programs I, I helped somebody get a straight state grant in, for $10 million in Washington State where the grant application was like eight pages long. They basically sat down and went, if we give you this money, will you do it? And they said, yes, yeah. and that was it. I mean, and that's that's where you get to this issue of like pre-vetting who you're working with, right? Mm -hmm, right. This is something that the federal government- They know, really the, they know this ISP, so- Right. And, and so like you do the hard work up front and then you, you make it easy. That's a program that is designed to rapidly and connect people. Mm -hmm. This is a program that is trying to fill too many buckets. Or the, too this many one is going to the states and the states know the ISP is already in. They, well, they sh it should be the same. That's what we haven't really discussed is that we talk about the federal part of this and what they've done wrong. But now we're putting it into the state's hands and all the bureaucracy 
bureaucracy that happens there and where what's going to happen when the money, when it gets to the states and where are they going to disseminate it out to? Are they pro big telco or is, or are they going to only go big telco or are they going to try to like get some of the, not only state by state, but here's my worst fear on the state side. Most states do not have an experienced set of grant reviewers. Only a handful do. And even the ones who do have had big turnover because there's better paying jobs elsewhere. Right. They are going to get these complicated grants and, and, and the, you know, if a grant has 10 requirements, they're going to, a short little simple grant, they're only going to actually understand six of them. If we now blow it out to 40 requirements, they're still going to only understand six of them. They're not going to have any idea how to review these grants. So they're still going to make all those mistakes the NTIA is worried about. They have no idea how to do this. Well, it's that goes cool. back. Yeah, it yeah. goes back to the broad people who are leading this at the broadband or the state level, the broadband directors in who like states can attract anybody and the people they are attracting don't necessarily have any um, expertise in this field. Like, I mean, you have Chad Roop, who is the state broadband director of Montana, um, who used to be the USDA administrator, just left to go be a general manager of an ISP um, in the Southwest. It's That is a perfect example of somebody who would understand this process more than anybody, but now is going back to the private sector. So it's who is who is going to be in control of this money and do they? I mean, the, yeah. the state of Michigan, for example, just put out their job search for their first director. Anyone who looks at this thing is going to go, I don't want this freaking job. <laughs> Because well, I mean, well, this is a no-win position to be put in. The don't don't you think that like the broadband officer? Travis, sorry, just one second. I, I want to just make sure we come back to that. But go ahead, Travis. <laughs> My prediction is is the established broadband offices are just going to give the money to the art the people they're already giving it to. You know, so like in Minnesota, there's probably six or eight ISPs that get every grant every year. They're just going to keep giving it out. That's the easiest method for them. Um, you know, I, I got a kick out of last week's um, uh, show where they were talking about these maps I, and how the maps are going to drive this data. Well, the, <laughs> that's what the, that's what the lady from the state of Minnesota I said. Well, how do you determine who's going who gets this money? She goes, "Well, we use our maps." Well, now we find you know, well, the maps it, really that's how you you know that that's how you're doing it. It doesn't take long to figure out who could use the cash in this state or any other states, mm-hmm. um, and it certainly isn't isn't a map. So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just really I'm fascinated with the thought of who in the private sector other than the large incumbents would even bother with this. So let's let's this is going to be a bet. We're going to we're going to wrap up on that in a, in a few minutes. I think as to like what our expectations are regarding uh, a how much of the money is not claimed B, um, uh, how much of it goes to the largest providers. But I want to come back to something that Doug said first. Um, uh, this is this is a political document in many ways that I think, um, and again, I'm getting this from someone else had a very sharp analysis that um, uh, this is something that imposes a lot of the Biden administration priorities on states that have uh, different rules. Um, you know, for instance, like we have like uh, this, these pro labor like rules now that a state, a person, you know, in, in Arkansas, a person in um, South Carolina has to figure out how to keep a pro-labor, um, you know, NTIA happy while following the rules of South Carolina and then navigating among, you know, conservative, um, you know, um, what they would call, uh, you know, I, I don't, don't want to, I'm trying not to use political language, but like they're less, you know, less supportive of the of the unions. Um, and that's the culture and that's the workforce and, you know, um, a number of, uh, of things in South Carolina. So, not only does a person running a state broadband office have to figure out all these technical things of how you do this, you also have to sit in the middle of this and like, you want to be in Florida talking about like how these networks deal with climate when you're not allowed to even <laughs> like climate change or whatever. They're, they're not allowed to use that word literally. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's literally a law. So they're going to have an interesting climate change plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, there's a real, I mean, I don't feel like NTIA, you know, um, I, I've heard some real frustration from state offices that they feel like NTIA took um, a, a difficult situation has made it even more difficult for the states to deal with um, the way these rules are designed. I completely agree. Um, so one other thing that I wanted to touch on, um, Doug, I, I went through this last night and then I went through it again and I was already just way too tired. 
I don't really understand the prioritization when it comes to this issue that Congress had included regarding the multifamily buildings. Um, to me, it looks like it's still not clear if you have to spend, if you have to have resolved every unserved premise before you put money into a multifamily building that has very high poverty. No, and I've read it three times and I can't figure out the order of that either. It, part of it tells me that that can be way up front. Another part of me tells me that's way at the end. I, I, I can read both of those interpretations into it. So I think that language allows states to make up their own mind because I can see both positions right in the language here uh, because it's not clear. So that's why you're in, that's why you're confused. I, I couldn't understand it either. So Okay. Um, I think that's, I think that's, Good. I mean, that's better than. Yeah. <laughs> See, I like nebulous language. They give states lead room. Most of this language isn't nebulous. Nebulous language is great. Remember the <clears throat> when the last NTIA grant came out? All it did was it suggested things. Remember that? It suggested things. It didn't require right. almost anything. This one requires a ton of stuff. So this has the word shall in it a whole lot. So yes. <clears throat> So as we're wrapping up, um, our guest wasn't able to do anything that may have been a confusion. Um, what do we, what predictions do we want to make? And do we have any, any enter entertaining bets that I can lose? Um, we have, I think, two different categories. One is Travis texted me and said he thinks 99% of the money will go to the big incumbents. And I immediately said, I'll take that action. Yeah, so I, I don't know if you want to revise that, Travis, to a more yeah. reasonable estimate. Mm. 99.5%. <laughs> I would take the bet if you said 80%. 80 or to 75 to 80% goes to big big incumbents. I would take that bet. <clears throat> I don't think the big incumbents want people. that much money. They don't want to serve a lot of these places. Yeah, that's, that's where, true. Uh, that's a good point, too. It, it's actually a really good point. And there was a big conversation in the WISP forum about this. I think it, how nervous they are about getting overbuilt. I don't think anyone's going to want to overbuild the vast majority of them. They're already doing a good job and serving the community. And there's so much, um, you know, hair on this deal. Here's what I would say. Take $44 billion, give it to the state, give $1 billion to Kim and we'll help her. I think she could do more good with, with one forty fifth of the money than the other 44 per, uh, combined. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, they don't let me build anything. I just get to talk to you guys. Yeah. But one question Man, that's that an I awesome did have. Job. That's an awesome <laughs> is so, th 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 there's you... there's my challenge to the NTIA because I, I just I think this is gonna this your once in a lifetime opportunity in five years from now we're gonna be going well now we have our new once in a lifetime opportunity because the last once in a lifetime is all gone. It'll be 2030 before that happens. Go ahead, Trent. Go ahead, Kim. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, you, you talk about the big incumbents or the little guys don't want to overbuild or whatnot. But what about the communities? Do the communities, <clears throat> are the communities going to reach out and try to assist some of these ISPs uh, in order to help them? Okay. Force them to great out? question. The original Congress language which absolutely called what I call layering. Get your NTIA grant, get this grant, bead, add on uh, ARPA money onto it. This discourages layering on ARPA money. It actually actively says that the states should discourage that because they want the ISPs to put skin in the game. And so the answer is there, this is not helpful. I think this actually kills a lot of public-private partnerships that are already being talked about. Now, again, I think the broadband offices can say, hell no, we're, we're doing public-private partnerships. But, but the actual language discourages that very severely. So. It, Almost in every single case, it went against the the the, the gist of what the federal language in, right in the Congress said you should do, and it's going the opposite direction. There's a, I want to get back to the bet, but I also uh, forgot that I did want to make sure that we covered digital equity. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think this is another thing that this is, it does show a serious commitment that, that the, those getting the money will have to uh, right. commit to having plans and figuring out how to serve everyone. Um, I don't really have a sense yet of how effective it will be, but it's very clear that that is a priority, that this is not just about um, just building rural networks. It is trying to make sure that low income families are able to access them. But my problem there is, but if the money all goes to the big guys, they're going to pay lip service to that and not really do it. They're not using they're not using the thirty dollar discount today. So are they really going to put any real effort? Did you miss the White House press conference, Doug? Well, no, they all signed up for the program. They're just not actually signing any people up for it. 
<laughs> Travis no. has probably signed up more I, people for it than Charter has. I can't imagine that President I can't imagine that President Biden would have got together with all those big companies that have written him those big checks and patted them on the back unless they're actually doing something really good, Doug. Well, what they did was sign up for the program. They did. I bet. They just well, don't, actually, I mean, they don't actually go and tell people how to get into it. <laughs> they they are also, I mean, they did go with a more of a, a better plan than just 50 megabits by 10. So that is right. good. Right. Um so okay, the last question then is this one of um, uh, Doug. Do you have a do you have a number? How much is going to the big incumbents? I'm going to say sixty percent. Sixty, but that's because I think some of that forty percent will be given to anybody. Okay, so that's and we're going to do these percentages okay. based on the amount distributed. Um, um, th then I would say seventy five percent. Okay. So my next question then is, what are we going to do? What is our guess based on how much money is left on the table? Um, in the, and let's say on the, this first round, like, um, are, are we going to see significant rule revision? Let, let's change it to a mm -hmm. binary. Will we see significant rule revisions because no one goes after the money in so many areas? Absolutely. Yes. And that might be why more money gets given out. If by two years from now, no one's applying, they're going to have to change the rules. Right. So that's a good point. But on the first round, I say 20% and no one asked for it. Yeah. I was going to go to 40% that nobody asked for. I was even going to go higher than you, Doug. Look at us. Well, I'm still an optimist in my heart. I don't, <laughs> as much as I hate this, I'm hopeful. But I'm, I, I, you're probably right. So. Is it taxable? Do we know that answer? Yes, it absolutely is taxable unless you're a tax free entity. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's well, another that's, nice bonus on top. That, that makes it even better. So hold on. <laughs> You get you get a grant that has ten thousand rules on it, and it's taxable. Yeah, and, and those, and those rules drive up the size of the money yeah. we need to take. Well, where, where do we yeah, sign up for this? Yeah, this <laughs> thing. We've we've been rough on NTIA. It is not NTIA's fault that that's no, taxable. Congress did that. The Republican Congress, Congress deliberately crafted a bill that was trash. In, in during the during the Trump administration, they passed it, and that's how we ended up with this. NTIA and the IRS cannot fix it. Congress has no, to. No, Congress has to. Fix it. I, yeah, that that's fine. I'm just saying that it's just another. I mean, that's another nail. In the I, I would love Chris yeah. for you to find somebody that's actually going to apply for some of this money. I'd be fascinated to hear why. Well, I like Travis. I think you've made that statement at least, at least 10 times in the past hour. Who is going to apply? Well, for I, I just, I, I can't, I can't think no, of it. We'll have a, we're going to have a show where we're going to find this person. What is this their great. business model? I mean, How do they finance it? I Doug, mean, I'm keep, fascinated by it. Keep an eye out, Doug. I'm going to ask people at Mountain Connect. I'm going to ask Kevin Clay mm -hmm. at Vantage Point. Um, they're they're going to know folks that are that are that are going to try this out. I think they're going to be upset about it, but I think they're going to. Um, I mean, I don't know that we'll have any firm commitments until the states actually develop their rules. Um, and Here's so that's going to take some Let's time. Just say somebody goes, "I'm going to do it," and then they go to their bank to get the letter of credit, and they go, "I can't, I can't give you a letter of credit. They're dead. There's too many gotchas in here." So, yeah, which is, which which means it has to be an entity of a certain amount of size. I mean, Kim right. could go get a letter of credit. She could. I, I now, after all, after 27 years of doing this, could get a letter of credit. Well, would but, you want to? Is that the best use of your money? If you oh, tie that money, I would. That, I would that, not. I would not tie up money. That would tie up money that you then couldn't borrow to use for your expansion. Ten million of dry powder that just sits there for it years is, there. is the absolute worst right. use of 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 debt you can use. Right. And that's, I think that's just so important. People do not understand the financing. I mean, hell, like, I feel like people think of me as generally knowing some people confusedly think of me as someone who knows what's going on. I'm still trying to figure this out, but like, it's such an important point. It's not just that ISPs will find a challenge in getting a letter of credit. It's that if they do get the letter of credit, then they are committing to not using their capital to expand as, as effectively as they could. That's dumb. It's a dumb program requirement. And somehow they have to tie up their supply chain for four years. <laughs> I just can't see yeah, that. Yeah. I'm sorry, Kim. But it's thirty percent. Well, thirty percent well, won't be given out. Seventy percent. Well, okay, you're up to thirty. <laughs> but I mean, even tying up their supply chain, even at Team Utopia, we had some supply chain that we had ordered, but then the vendor gave it to somebody else, and right. it's like, oh, so we had already done this, but now we're scrambling to go find more because of an error on the vendor's part. So, like, it's just not reasonable requests in the in the NoFo. So, so what is the numbers and what is the bet? Because I'm feeling pretty good right now about my odds here. So, well, I, don't, I, don't know. I will still take any bet for the 99.5%. <laughs> <laughs> well, 90, okay, so hold on. There, there's, been, there's been some updates, though, to the bet because 
99.5% of the money that actually gets allocated will go to the large incumbents in the service area. How much of the money will actually get divvied out? 25% at the current rolls or less. Wow. Unless Chris can, can find somebody that can explain how they're going to do it, their business model, because using my basic finance 101, I, I, it doesn't work at all. I mean, I... Okay. I I'd chuck the thing in the garbage and go on down the road and keep hooking people up to the internet. Um, I have a question, Travis. Are you going to apply for some of this bead money? I'm just, I just, I haven't figured this out yet. Oh, no, no. What, still, you still a little you don't understand yeah. that the unserved in Minnesota are multi-million dollar lake homes in northern Minnesota. They're not, they're not the, you know, the neighborhoods that we serve of low income individuals in Minneapolis. You know, that's the part about this whole thing that blows my mind. And I've, I said this last time, 85% of Americans will not benefit from this at all. Because they live in cities. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just, it blows my mind that yeah, we're spending this kind of money. I mean, it, it did strike me um, reading the, the statement at the beginning of the, the bead NOFO that um, you know President Biden's goal is to make sure that all Americans have access to this and that and other thing. And I was like, no, that's that's not the goal of this. The goal of this is to, um, is to serve people in rural areas. It does very little for the vast majority of people who are not on the internet today, who live in cities, who have affordability challenges or other challenges relating to digital skills and things like that. There's a little bit of money put into that, not nearly enough, but, but like Travis is saying, there's a ton of people that desperately need um, you know, something better. And we're ignoring them because they are mostly people from marginalized communities. They are people that it would piss off the cable companies if we come up with a better solution because it's their turf. Um, the Biden administration has not wanted to have that fight. Only a few courageous people in Congress have wanted to have that fight. And so we keep losing on that, but we'll keep pretending that it's about connecting all Americans. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say is that, like, this is definitely about connecting rural um, areas that are non-tribal. Because we know that the tribal need is so great. Um, these are the highest cost areas. These are areas that will need continued subsidy. And, and, and the amount of money that's been put aside is like maybe 20% of what needs to be spend, spent in, to connect tribal areas. So there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of money that will be maybe spent ineffectively. But we're still, there's no plan for actually connecting everyone. We're not close to that yet. And why we're, before we leave, where's our next FCC commissioner coming in? Oh, God. That's even funnier. <laughs> the next FCC commissioner will be appointed by a Republican president in 2025. Yes. Um, when does Gigi give up the fight and just, like, say, I'm out. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't know. What I just said is based totally on pessimism and ignorance. But, like, um, I'm super disappointed, and I wish the Biden administration did better on this. Chris, do you know anyone? I, I like Kenneth's idea. I mean, I'm not trying to be a dink about this. I'm just trying to understand how it works. And you know, with dealing with this in the real world, I mean, I'd love for somebody to come on and explain to us, but I think it just gets intertwined with so much politics that it probably I probably wouldn't even understand it because well, it's, part of the reason that we, you know, and I agree, and I'm in a similar position. Um, you know, the and I don't think the Biden administration folks that you know people who are who are who have worked decided to move to NTIA as a public service appreciate all our criticism, um, and I do appreciate the work that they're they're doing on this. But there's a there's definitely challenges, and mm -hmm. um, and the simple fact is is that like this is a political world mm -hmm. and NTIA <clears throat> officials who are there probably largely believe that they need whether they will admit it or whether it's subconscious or not. And I can tell you that the leadership absolutely understands this. They want to craft this program to try and help Biden get reelected, right? Because they, from their point of view, no matter how good the program is, it doesn't do well if a bad administration, from their point of view, then comes into power. And so these things are always political documents. And how is, is, is Biden is not running again? There's no way. Let's not even get into that. They can't, Biden can't be running again. I wouldn't say that there's no way. Um, but. Um, but I, but I mean I think that that's the issue yeah. is that like people people in DC they take us seriously well, some of them do not all of them and they and they listen to shows like this they listen to other really good shows and uh, hey there's Matt in the background hey Matt wave you're on TV, you're on, you're on TV. <laughs> is that Matt okay, from Ar okay. Arcadian Matt Rantanen who uh, who helps me uh, who I help <laughs> depending on who you want to talk to does travel broadband boot camp so <laughs> um so anyway like i mean i think we are interested in um 
you know, and helping them to understand this. But at the same time, like I mean, we told tons, tons of people, the letter of credit thing doesn't work and it's counterproductive. And, you know, and there's different dynamics where no one wants to be in front of a congressional committee being told that they screwed everything up because they didn't have enough safeguards as to who was getting the money. Right. So, um, I mean, this is not a matter of like, oh, the, like Joe Biden sucks because he's a political animal. The people at the high level of D.C. are always political animals. That's how it works. I think that's the system that we have. Well, should we say one positive thing about this, though, other than just ripping on it the whole time? We did say a few positive things. So about the it, the yeah. pro fiber component, I was very impressed with, quite yeah. frankly. Yes. That, that I was impressed with. Yes. I think it's huge. I think that's huge. That's the right move. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Well, I think, I mean, I, I think we focused on some of the challenges. There's some unforced errors. There's some totally reasonable things that I disagree with that, like, you know, just, you know, people have to make hard decisions. Um, but some of the stuff like the letter of credit, it's just like, it needs to be fixed. Um, and will some of this change then? Is that what this NOFO thing is? Is there, are there, is there going to be, or is this no, now what, this, is this this is what the program is? This is the document. Yeah, this is it. Oh, this I mean, is it? This is now like what it's going to be. This is not a ask for comments. This has been issued. Yeah. Oh shit! Can I lower my bet? Sorry. I don't... <laughs> oh, this is it. This is it, my friend. Oh, this will be a disaster. Mark I feel like words. the coffee is now just kicking in for everyone. Everybody's yeah, yeah. like, "Oh, we're here." Yeah. Like okay. Travis finally just realized what the topic is today. Oh, I, I'm still stuck on the map one from last week. Where, Doug, Doug, Kim, get this. We have to send in every service address and what I we know. offer. Every yes. one. It, this is like the most unbelievably awesome thing in the world for as a competitor where you get to poach all of your your competition right. but right. it's also the it's the worst thing for you know everybody's just going to be picking off each other you know down to the service address well especially but, if, you, okay. if you if you provide businesses they're going to know where all your business are your I know uh, <laughs> in what world do you pass over your customer list to your competition well Think about this, Travis, as an open access network with 18 residential providers. How yep. do they report that? Because they could service all of those addresses, all of them. And so they each like, have, and they each yeah. have to report inside your network. How yeah. They gonna well, yeah, but I, my understanding yeah. is only the ones that you're actually wired to. So would the Utopia would need to report, not the ISP. I would. But they assume. also can report places they could get yeah. to in 10 days, and that's pretty much everywhere. Yeah. 10 days, yeah. Imagine trying to guarantee a 10 days in in yeah. this tundra we Chris and I live in up north here. Yeah, good luck with that. Well, I tell you one way they did that. Just as a real side note. Any place over fifteen hundred feet away from the network is not allowable for the map. That's one way they limited it. So, okay. Um, anyhow, we never did make a bet, but let's all make our bet next time. Yes, and uh, I've traded in the tundra. I for, about the bet. Yeah. I've traded in the tundra for a smell of pine trees in the morning, so I'm enjoying that. Oh, me too. Look, I'm at, I look. I'm in like Florida. <laughs> But I will be in Breckenridge or uh, Keystone next week, so I am not looking forward to that being cold. Yeah, anyone who hasn't decided yet, Connect, Mountain Connect is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I have to run. Things are getting hopping. And um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I um, uh, really appreciate Doug and Kim and Travis, uh, last minute show. I didn't want to wait two weeks to cover this, and uh, I'm really glad that you were able to make time available. So thank you. Thank everyone for, for watching. And uh, it's been another episode of Connect This. Thank you.